morning. Good morning. <laughs> Please join together as we sing together our gathering hymn. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Please be seated. So wonderful to see all of you out there. Good morning and welcome, everyone, to First Unitarian Church. We are here in Portland, Oregon, and our mission is to nurture the individual spirit and together to work toward building that beloved community. Welcome all gathered here this morning and welcome all gathered online. After the service, I hope you'll join fellow congregants for a social hour. To join virtually, you'll see a QR code after the service. And to join in person, we'll gather uh, downstairs in Fuller Hall, immediately below this sanctuary. A reminder to voting members of the congregation, ballots naming Reverend Bill Minister Emeritus are due at 12.15 today. So if you didn't get those in on your way in, please do that. And next Sunday, June 19th, will be a special Sunday. We will celebrate Reverend Bill Sinkford's ministry here. Reverend Dr. Susan Frederick Gray, the current president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, will preach for us that morning. And Reverend Bill and members of the congregation will join in a release of call ritual next Sunday. Just as Bill and this congregation entered into a covenant when he came to this church as minister, this ritual will mark a release of, from that covenant as Bill retires from the active ministry of this congregation. And after the service, there's a wonderful reception being planned to honor Bill and his wife Maria, so I hope to see you all again next Sunday. And the following Sunday, on June the 26th, we will not have a service here at our church since the Unitarian Universalist Association General Assembly will be in Portland. We hope folks will attend that Sunday morning service, worship with other UUs, either virtually or in person. Stay tuned for details on, on, uh, on, how to, on how we'll do that. Let's take a moment now as we gather this morning to greet one another in person or virtually. Let's greet our neighbors.
Reverend Bill will light the chalice here on our chancel this morning. If you have a chalice or a candle at home, I invite you to light that now. We are Unitarian Universalists. We light this chalice in faith, in hope, and in love.
First Unitarian Church is a beacon of hope for us and for our community, a spiritual center in the heart of our city that helps each of us to find our moral compass, calling, and challenging us to build the beloved community with an ever-deepening sense of spirit, diversity, and inclusion. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Come now, and let us worship. I invite you to sing our hymn, O oh, the Beauty in a Life. Please rise in body or in spirit. join in our responsive reading. It's entitled, For Nothing is Fixed Forever, by James Baldwin. For nothing is fixed forever, forever, forever. It is not fixed. The earth is always shifting. The light is always changing. The sea does not cease to grind down rock. Generations do not cease to be born. And we are responsible to them because we are the only witnesses they have. The sea rises, the light fails, lovers cling to each other, and children cling to us. The moment we cease to hold each other, the moment we make break faith with one another, the sea engulfs us and the light goes out. Let's sing together now our doxology, Spirit of Life. Thank you.
Please be seated. It's so wonderful to see you all here. We used to do this this week, every, this way every week. Do you remember that? <laughs> before COVID, and you do remember before COVID, right? <laughs> before COVID in this service at the end of the church year, we would all bring flowers as most of the folks here in the sanctuary have done today. And after telling the story of Norbert Chopek, the minister of the Prague Unitarian Church, who died in a Nazi concentration camp and who created the Unitarian Flower Communion, after telling that story and blessing the flowers with Chopek's words, everyone would be invited to come down the aisles to receive a blessing and to take a flower from one of the baskets as a sign and a symbol of the hope that we share. Today, many of us, most probably, are attending online still, and an invitation to physical closeness, although you're managing it quite well here in the sanctuary thus far, still feels a little bit tentative for most of us. So it doesn't feel appropriate to invite you down in the same way that we did in years past. But the sharing and the appreciation of the flowers, the signs of hope, the symbols of love that we have before us, that we can still do. So for those here in the sanctuary, as you are leaving after the service, the baskets of flowers will be out in the lobby. And you are invited to take a flower, take one that seems to speak particularly to you. Take a flower as a symbol of the hope that we find here in this sanctuary week after week. And, and for those of us who are joining online this morning, if you did not bring a flower with you, don't have it right beside you when you, as you signed on this morning, I encourage you at some point today to find a flower and to take a moment to appreciate that flower as a gift to you from the natural world, a gift, if you will, from the interdependent web of life that can sustain hope as well. We can do that, and we can bless, we can consecrate these flowers that have been given to us to help us sustain hope. The words of Norbert Chopek written so long ago in other troubled times. Infinite spirit of life, we ask your blessings on these flowers, your messengers of fellowship and of love. May they remind us amid diversities of knowledge and of gifts to be one in desire and affection and the devotion to your holy will. May they also remind us of the value of comradeship, of doing and sharing alike. May we cherish friendship as one of your most precious gifts. May we not let awareness of another's talents discourage us or sully our relationship, but may we realize that whatever we can do, great or small, the efforts of all of us are needed to do your will in this world. Amen. Each week in our service, we share our offering with organizations whose values are aligned with our own. This month, we are sharing our plate with the Northwest Abortion Access Fund, or NWAAF. It is an organization staffed by trained volunteers that helps people in the Pacific Northwest seeking abortion to source safe lodging and funds to support travel and clinic fees. The Access Fund lives out the principles of reproductive justice, which asserts that all people have the right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, 
to have children, to not have children, and to parent the children they do have in safe and sustainable communities. In this month, we are expecting a Supreme Court decision that could drastically change the reproductive rights landscape in this country and likely will. It is especially important that we work to ensure that all people seeking abortions can access the health care that they need. Even more so, it is a joy for us to support an organization that holds this wider vision of a world where reproductive justice is made real. We need this vision now more than ever. If you are joining this morning via live stream, there will be options on your screen to donate, either by, by QR code or the donate button. Those of you who are here in person can also turn to the info card that might be on the back of the seat in front of you. It has a QR code and a link to donate virtually. And after the service, there will be ushers collecting cash and check donations outside in the narthex. Thank you for your generosity, which supports this congregation and the work of partners in our larger community.
We make a space each week here in our service for the concerns of our community life together. A reminder that you're welcome to light a candle of intention or leave a prayer request in one of our galleries, or you can submit a prayer request online to prayers at firstunitarianportland.org. And to have a concern announced here, send it to parish concerns at firstunitarianportland.org. This morning, we hold longtime church member and former moderator Jim Zarin. Jim, last Sunday evening, suffered a heart arrhythmia attack uh, and blessedly was revived by paramedics, and Jim is with us this morning, so we give thanks for that, and we hold Jim for his continued recovery. This morning, we also hold Hunter Androsenko Hale, a young adult who grew up in our church, as he heals from surgery this week. Hunter and his mother, Cynthia Hale, welcome our healing and positive thoughts during this time. Will you join me now in prayer? Spirit of life and of love, God of many names and of no name at all, hear our prayers this day. We celebrate these flowers around us and all they represent this day, Spirit. The bounty and beauty of our earth in all of its splendor that offers us blessing. The results of sunshine and rain and all the other nutrients that would make such abundance, such variety and color and fragrance possible. Help us to, Spirit, celebrate our own abundance our beauty and the beauty around us. Even in the midst of a world that seems so broken, so hurting, help us to find the beauty too. Help us to stay present with so much violence, so much hatred, so much cynicism, so much that would separate us from each other and from you, Spirit. Help us to see ourselves over and over again as part of this magnificent creation. May we be healers, justice makers, creators, ministers, lovers of life. Just as the earth so amazingly renews itself in this season, may we find hope and renewal in our own living. Help us to imagine, help us to make real a world where peace, where justice, where love come to be. And in our being, in our doing, in our living, may it help us each and all as we find our way. So be it. Amen. Let's keep silence now for a time together. Let's remain seated as we sing together. My life flows on in endless song.
This morning is entitled Closure by Amanda Gorman. To begin again isn't to go backwards, but to decide to go. Our story is not a circle carved, but a spiral shed, shaped, spinning, shifting inward and outward ad infinitum like a lung on the bank of speech. Breathe with us. We disembark both beside and beyond who we were, who we are. It is a return and a departure. We spiral on, pushing up and out like a growing thing, making its form out of earth. In a poem, there is no end just a place where the page glows wide and waiting. Like a lifted hand, poised and paused, here is our bond, unbordered by bone. Perhaps love is how it feels to breathe the same air. All we have is time, is now. Time takes us on. How we are moved says everything about what we are to each other and what are we to each other if not everything. Lucille Clifton once said, come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. The composer of, of the piece we're about to sing, Judy Rose, tells of a story of one day driving from Portland back to her home in Vancouver, Washington. She calls it Vantucky. Uh, and it was nighttime, and it was on 205, and it was dark, and um, a, a man in a, in a pickup truck um, noticed Judy and noticed her black face driving along 205, and proceeded to do everything in his power to try to get her off the road. Followed her relentlessly, trying violently to, to take her car off of the road. And somehow by grace, by miracle, by favor, by whatever it is, by persistence, by courage, Judy survived and made it home to her wife in Vancouver and wrote the words, each day, begins and ends with me, which is how this song came to be. Judy's here today and will be joining us on the solos. Thank you. Yes. 
there's a day in my heart that's burning in my soul. Where trouble is no more a day to heal my soul. Yes, Lord, hear my soul. Oh, hear my soul. Ain't no more trouble coming over me. Trouble. I am going to shout until I'm finally free. Evil can't win unless you let it. But sometimes I forget. That I am strong beyond all measure. Ain't no trouble coming over me. Ain't no trouble coming over me. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Judy. It will be a minor miracle if I get through this, so just bear with me. <laughs> there is ministry. Wherever there is a meeting that summons us to our better selves, wherever our lostness is found, our fragments are reunited, our wounds begin healing, our spines stiffen, 
and our muscles grow strong for the task. There is ministry. I don't know who wrote those words, none of us do, but I have gone back to them again and again since I accepted the call to this pulpit 12 years ago. And they are very present to me as my ministry here draws to a close. Those words speak to wholeness and healing, to the truth that each of us and all of us feel lost at times, and to the truth that here, in this sanctuary, so often we can find ourselves found. That we can be found and find a way forward that we can finally be free. As religious people, our commitment to science makes us leery of most miracle claims. But I have to tell you that it is a miraculous thing that we expect here in this sanctuary week after week. To find some truth and the strength of spirit to keep on keeping on, to be encouraged and inspired to live the love that we talk about. It's a miraculous thing that we expect and so often find here in this sanctuary. I've preached over 400 sermons from this pulpit, <laughs> given so many prayers and blessings, really beyond counting. What more possibly could I have to preach to you <laughs> that I have not preached already? You've heard me speak of the beloved community, not to pat this community on its back, but to remind us all of where our hope resides and of the commitment required to live the way we truly want to live. You've heard me ask you to believe, just as I ask myself to believe, that love just might be stronger than hate and able to overcome fear, that love just might in the end win. You've often heard me revisit history, retell our collective story to acknowledge structures of privilege and oppression that thrive on remaining unseen. And you've heard me call us individually and collectively to confession and repentance and repair, though I often did not use those words when I issued that call. There have been calls to action issued from this pulpit, but also calls to prayer. For though thoughts and prayers cannot be our only response to the violence in the world as religious people, prayer must be part of our response. And you've heard me over and over cast a vision of inclusive community in which our differences are blessings and where power is unleashed by our pluralism a vision of a community in which the voices of those most pressed down are most held up, a vision, a vision of community worthy of being called beloved. And if you haven't taken in those messages in these last 12 years, well, it's probably too late now. But there are, there are just a few thoughts I want to leave you with, a, a last word or two that I want to preach for you. First, though it is not my role to judge the ministry that we have done together here, I do want to say that we have done good, even remarkable ministry here together. When the next version of the history of this congregation is written, and I know Cindy Cumper is here. <laughs> and my ministry is considered from the perspective of a distance of time, the engagement with race will probably be named as its central theme. That and the language of beloved community, which are not unrelated, as you know. But I hope that you will also remember from these 12 years Remember the maturing of lay ministry and the deepening of our faith development programming 
wellspring, and so on. The shift in our justice work from a, a privileged place to partnership with other justice seekers, especially from frontline communities. The wider offering of our sexuality education program and the introduction of family worship. Expanding musical vocabularies in worship and the beginnings of the spirit moving within us and among us in at least somewhat more embodied ways. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. The point that I am making is that the ministry of this congregation is done by so many persons. By the staff, certainly. The ministers and program staff, the tech support and building maintenance and administrative staff. The excellence of the staff has grown, I do believe, from the very high level that I found when I arrived. So the staff, yes but also all the volunteers, the teachers and ushers, the greeters, those who care for the grounds, the justice leaders, so many of them, and all those who show up for the marches and the hearings and the acts of public witness, and those who volunteer in the office and the bookstore and serve on the board and the nominating committee, the ministerial search committee, the foundation board, the public health team, the real estate task force, the RE committee, the music council, the audit committee. I could go on and on. But I hope you hear my point, that we have shared this ministry. We have done this ministry together. This time for me is an ending. And there is a new ministry beginning. And it is important to recognize and celebrate these transitions. Honoring transitions in our lives is a central part of what the church does. From dedicating ourselves to our children, to memorializing our elders, graduations, marriages, beginnings of ministry, and endings of ministries. We celebrate transitions in life here in this sanctuary. And I want you to know that I feel a rightness in this ending. You have heard my version of the good news for 12 years. It is time for you to hear that good news spoken in another voice, drawing on different life experiences. This is time for a fresh view that can open new possibilities, and frame new answers to the religious questions that abide. But, but it is also critical to recognize the ongoingness of this great church. More than 150 years of history gather with us in this sanctuary, and the hope for many more years of ministry to come are also present as we gather here. This is a community of both memory and of hope. And all ministers know or should, and I hope you can understand this, that every ministry is an interim ministry. Every ministry is a temporary assignment. We serve for a time and we're privileged to do so. And ministers, influence the ministry of the church as we serve, of course. But the ministry of the church is not defined, at least not only defined, by its ministers. The ministry of this great church relies on the ministries of literally hundreds of congregants and dozens of staff members, as well as the called ministers. To describe this ministry as a shared ministry is both true and one of the more radical understatements in life. There's an old saying that great ministers create great congregations, but that it is great congregations that create great ministers. And after 12 years here, I know that to be true. There's another thing I need to share with you in this last sermon. The world that we have lived through the world in which we have ministered has been challenging from the day that I arrived. 
I arrived in the midst of what we call the Great Recession. You remember that, most of you? Following the financial collapse that began in 2008, layoffs and furloughs were happening all around in this city and in this nation, and we managed to survive without either. We ministered through the Occupy movement that insisted that income inequality and greed were tearing the fabric of this nation apart. We managed to survive as an economically diverse religious community, not perfectly diverse, but still. We saw both gentrification and houselessness, two sides of the same coin, come to characterize progressive Portland. The movement for black lives and the continuing violence against black and brown bodies finally called this community to action. Over 150 days of protest, with resolution still not visible on the horizon, sad to say. And, and we saw the introduction of technology into the life of this church, streaming worship and the screens, <laughs> so appreciated now, so controversial when they went up. <laughs> then COVID, which led to my extending my ministry here, which has tested us all and leaves so many questions about so many things as we regather. COVID, which supercharged changes in our world that we are only beginning to understand. And now war in Ukraine and the pressing truth of gun violence. Our ministry here has taken place in the midst of challenges every year I have been here. But it has been the rise of an all too successful nativist movement that is the most troubling to me. Make America Great Again attempts to turn back what little democracy we have managed to create and what little liberation we have managed to live. We are having to give up what we now can name as a naive belief in a confident future of progress toward beloved community abroad and here at home. The spiritual challenge of these days is truly great. Now, preachers are taught to bring the good news to the people, to point the congregation toward hope so that, so that the congregation can navigate troubled times. But I have to tell you, and I hope that you can know, that it is getting harder and harder to preach these days. Harder and harder in the last few years, harder and hardest in this last year. It is hard to preach the good news when there is so little good news out in the world. Know that as you enter this next phase of your ministry. Twelve years ago, when I arrived, I described myself as the most experienced new parish minister on the planet. This church, First Unitarian, was my first congregational ministry, but I brought much experience in leading the church, that's the capital C church, and I hope to leave First Unitarian stronger than I found it, vibrant and confident and growing in spirit and in witness. And in many, many ways, this church is in much better condition, financially and spiritually, than it was when I was called. But the universe is not cooperating with my wish. The challenges facing this congregation and congregations in general and people of goodwill everywhere, the challenges before the church are great. And the responses the church will make could not be more important. But I have not managed to wrap my ministry up here with a bow. It will be the ongoingness of this church and a strength that will allow it to adapt and change that will see you through. And this is in your range. I've seen you do it time and again. This is in your range. But just as was the case when I arrived, I leave you in challenging times. And one last thought, I promise, one last. Twelve years ago,
12 years ago during my candidating week, I remember being asked why, why after such a successful ministry as president of the UUA, why I was called to serve a single congregation here on the west coast of the country. And I responded by saying how gratifying it had been to serve at the UUA and how much I thought we had accomplished during my presidency, but that my calling to ministry was a calling to serve one church, to preach to folks whose stories I knew, to dedicate particular children, to memorialize particular elders as they transitioned. I was called to the ministry of intimacy, where I could be welcomed into your lives. That was the ministry I was called to so many years ago, and I remember joking that my 17 years at the UUA were just a detour on that path to ministry. A long one, but a detour nonetheless. And I remember telling you that being called to First Unitarian was the fulfillment of my calling, the fulfillment, the, the purpose for which I said yes to the insistent voice that all ministers hear that asks us to rise up and follow and find ways to live in the service of love. I have learned so much here and grown so much here. I have been so fortunate to work with so many of you talented and faith-filled folks. I have been so deeply blessed by the opportunity you have given me to minister among you. So the one last thing I want to say to you before I go, the one thing that I want you to know if you know nothing else for certain, I want you all to know how deeply grateful I am to you for allowing me to be your minister. So grateful. That gratitude comes from a place so deep in me that it must be the place where the spirit of life lives for me. The poet Amanda Gorman, all we have is time, is now. How we are moved says everything about what we are to each other. And what are we to each other, if not everything? Bless you, as you have blessed me. And thank you. Amen. Will you pray with me one last time? Spirit of life and of love, God of beginnings and of endings, God of our coming together and of our parting, great spirit, I very rarely ask for things in my prayers, you know. But today I ask that whatever you truly are and however you truly move, that you hold these good people and this good church as they move forward. Hold them. 
not to shield them from the challenges they must face, but to help them know that they will not face those challenges alone, that they serve a larger love and a hope that transcends their individual lives, a love and a hope that they inherit and that they will pass on. May they hold the ministry we have done together here in my years. May they hold that ministry with gladness and a satisfaction tempered by humility. And may they welcome with open hearts and minds the new ministry that will lead with them toward the future. And great spirit, hold me and hold Maria as we say goodbye. This is such a bittersweet, such a tender time. May the love we have found and the love we have shared Give us all reason to face the future, not with confidence, but with hope. May that be so. And amen. amen. Let's sing. Let love continue long. Please rise in body or in spirit. Is the day we have been given. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. Go in peace. Practice love. Amen.